uh, we're back from hiatus. Thank you for tuning back in again. Just very, very quickly, because of various reasons, we had to take some time out. We're very excited to be back, and we're starting with a two-parter to come back. Yeah, this is our first episode on the film 500 Days of Summer, uh, which we recorded with the amazing Loretta. I'm really excited to share it. But yeah, um, there are some issues with the sound quality. We're using a different software now, so hopefully that'll be sorted out for future episodes. But we really love the content of this episode, and we really hope that you do as well. As we've talked about before, we are asking people to please rate and review us on iTunes. That would really help us boost the podcast. Um, And if you leave us a five-star review, we'll even read it out on the show. So yeah, I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And yeah, look out for another one very, very soon. It's great to be back. Hi, Lily. Hi, Loretta. Hi, Anna. Hi, Lily. <laughs> okay, so who changes the season when summer is over? I don't know, Lily. Who changes the season when summer is over? No one. It happens automatically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lily. I'm Loretta. And this is Liliana's pre-read media take. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. Yeah. And today we have our third guest overall. Very excited, my friend Loretta, who I met at uni in English class. Do you want to introduce yourself, maybe? Yeah. So I'm Loretta. I'm a hobby writer, former fellow student of Anna's, and I'm really excited to be on the show. Oh, you're so nice. <laughs> So happy to have you on. I'm so happy to finally meet you. Anna talks about you a lot, so I did not make her up. She's not imaginary. <laughs> Here in the flesh. And we were very excited because you picked the topic for today. You suggested because I asked like which movie would you like to talk about? And you suggested Five Hundred Days of Summer, which is gonna be our topic for today. Just as a story because again, Lily's a lot younger than me, Loretta's also younger than me. Do you when do you sort of remember when was the first time you ever saw this film? I saw it probably around the time it came out. Like I remember still watching it on iTunes, which was funny because <laughs> iTunes and the movie as well. <laughs> but yeah, it was actually I think it was today. It was the first movie I had bought on on iTunes, so it was around the time it came out. Yeah, two thousand nine, something like that. <laughs> Same for me. When when did you first see it, Lily? I think it was literally for this podcast. Yeah. I watched it. I watched like the first, I think, five or ten minutes of it. It was on TV one time a few years ago. My dad was watching it. It was the bit where it's like there are two types of people in the world, men <laughs> and women. <laughs> and I was like, and I left the room. <laughs> That's an appropriate reaction, frankly. I find that bit really funny. I find it so funny, but like maybe not for the right reasons. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was just so ridiculous. Um, I ended up watching it again today, and when that part came, I was like, "What? Like, how did I not remember this? It was so funny <laughs> seeing that." Yeah, which we're gonna talk about later. Sort of difference of perception, just watching this type of movie at very different ages. The things you also just don't remember is so interesting to me in terms of all the problematic stuff or just things where you're like, I don't remember this being in this film. But yeah. Lily, do you want to start with the with like the description? Because you wrote that down, but I Oh yeah. I pulled some information from Wikipedia. Um and here it is, just a bit of background. So yeah, the film came out in two thousand and nine, but it's directed by Mark Webb, screenplay by Scott Neustadt. Sorry. Wait, someone help me with this surname. Is it so it's just the most basic German city name because it just means new city. So a lot of places are called ah, Neustadt. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I would say Scott Neustadter, but I, or Neustädter, but he's American, so I have no idea how he would pronounce it. So. So screenplay by him and by Michael H. Weber, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zoe Deschanel. So it was um, an independent production picked up for distribution by Fox Searchlight Pictures, premiered at the 25th Sundance Film Festival. Um, garnered generally positive reviews and became a successful sleeper hit, earning over $60 million in worldwide returns um, compared to its $7.5 million budget. And yeah, it was kind of very well received at the time. And it's sort of one of those quite well-known rom-coms, I think. 
I just realized it's a lot cheaper than even passing was. Yeah. I just think it's interesting because we talked about this when we talked about yesterday that these type of budgets, movies just don't get made anymore or they get made for Netflix. Like $7.5 million, it just isn't really like a budget that they use for rom-coms anymore. And even like if you argue that the uh, period drama sort of like taking over the romance uh, rom-com genre, those things cost a lot more money just because of like costuming and stuff. So I wrote a little bit of summary so we can sort of jog our memory in case you haven't watched this movie in a long time as a lot of us also haven't. Um, okay. The movie starts with author's note. The following is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Especially you, Jenny Backman, bitch. Um, the narrator tells us this is not a love story. This was the bit that I do not remember from this film whatsoever. When I rewatched this, I was like, what? I don't remember that bit at all. Um, we meet Tom, heartbroken, his sister and his bros, console him and tell him it's going to be okay and asks what had happened. In a nonlinear structure, we see the two, um, Tom and Summer meeting, Tom falling for her, her not paying attention to him, them eventually starting to have sex and hang out. She keeps telling him that she does not believe in falling in love and relationships, but he keeps demanding that she declares herself his girlfriend. Summer gets hit on when they're at a bar and Tom punches the guy and Summer ends up breaking up with Tom and Tom falls into a depression. And the movie cuts back to the beginning, meaning the end of the relationship. When he looks back at his relationship, however, Tom realizes that Summer and he were not as happy as he thought. And he meets her again on his way to a wedding and they talk, laugh and dance at the wedding. She invites him to a party and he assumes that she wants to get back together but realizes that she is, in fact, engaged. Um, he quits his job and tries to resume his dream of becoming an architect. But before a job interview, he sees Summer, who has since gotten married, and she tells him that he was right about change and soulmates and everything. He was just not right about her. He goes to the interview and meets a fellow interviewee called Autumn, and the clock that was, talk that was counting down the days of Summer turns back to one. So again, as I said, the thing that I did not remember from this movie whatsoever was the beginning that it genuinely says, like, except you, Jenny Beckman, bitch. I do not remember that bit whatsoever. Was that her actual... It was her actual name then? Yeah. Did they get a consent for her, like, name to be included in that film? Like... So that was the that was the bit that I um, posted in the link. Um, so this was interviews with the screenwriter, with uh, Scott Neustadter, I think, um who talked about that this was actually based on an actual relationship, um, how he met this person at the London School of Economics. They fell in love. He sort of felt like he, it sort of lifted him out of a depression. And when they broke up, he was heartbroken, and she ended up getting married pretty quickly after the relationship ended. And he reached out to her, and she said that it was totally fine. But then she saw the actual movie, and um, then she like unfriended him on Facebook. <laughs> And <laughs> to stop talking to him. For two thousand nine. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <That's pretty cool. laughs> right? Like, yeah. fair enough. Imagine yeah, seeing absolutely. a movie where it's like, especially you, bitch. Like, what yeah. the hell? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Without giving your consent at all, and for everybody there to read your name. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping for her that she changed her name because, I mean, I tried to sort of quote unquote find her, but there's just a million people called Jenny Beckman. But thank God, like no one like approached her about this, I think. But it still sucks. Like this was a very, <laughs> this was a very successful film. And that like name was internationally like on so many screens. Horrible. Yeah. And especially the bitch bit. And I mean, not knowing how they departed really. I mean, if they had departed in a sort of humorous way, if they were on good terms, perhaps this would have been different but since she didn't know about this at all and it didn't didn't seem like the the friendliest breakup ever no no i mean there's that part late like in the film where one of the characters um says to tom like you know the uh, best way to get over a woman is to like turn her into literature and, like that's kind of what it is as well it's like turning this woman into issues um, and it's sort of yeah <laughs> not great exactly but it sounds like a dude like reading Henry Miller and being like, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's so dope and deep of me to turn a woman that wronged me into literature. 
In terms of consent, so she did read the script and then before they shot the movie because legal contacted him and was like, you have to like clear this with this person so we're not going to get sued. And she did consent to the movie being made. But uh, like the actual movie itself then really made her angry. It made her cut off oh. any conversation with him, made like any contact with him. Mm-hmm. Because again, it's a very different thing to like see that kind of thing on screen. And mm-hmm. she also, I think, based on the screen play, told him that she sort of felt like she felt more like she was Tom in the dynamic Ooh. between the two of them rather than Summer. So I think that's also very interesting. <laughs> that's really interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Doesn't surprise me that much. No, I mean, we're gonna. I think we're gonna touch on this a bit more later, but it sort of makes sense as like you would see because Tom is like the active player in the relationship. Like you see it through his eyes. So it kind of makes sense for you to like identify with the active character rather than the one that's sort of presented as like passive in the film or like the one that you like look at, you gaze at, but that doesn't really have that much or agency within like the narrative of the film. Yeah, that does make sense. Like going with the narrator, mm-hmm. trusting the narration. Yeah. Okay, so. On this podcast, as you may already know, um, we talk about the concept of a pre-read text, um, which is a term coined by Rowan Ellis, um, which is um, when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or a piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it's about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material, um, so that you have a kind of cultural consciousness of this um, of, sto- of stories, of characters, images, concepts, etc. Um, but that might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material, um, and in- instead all come from adaptations that have come after um, the source material has been made. Um, and we'll also be looking more generally at, at preconceptions that an audience member might bring to this piece of media. Um, so I think just jumping straight in, kind of our preconceptions of this film, the film itself, or like the kind of discourse around this film, I think is quite interesting. Um, because I think like before, because again, I hadn't seen it until like properly until like the last week or so. And so I kind of knew it as like the anti-rom-com. That's sort of like what it had been in my head. It was sort of this sort of like rom-com that's not like the other rom-coms kind of thing. And that sort of, <laughs> sort of like supposedly broke down um kind of rom-com tropes but then there was like this like there's some disagreement about like whether it did or not um and so that's why i was kind of quite excited to do it for this episode as well i sort of remembered this movie as like uh, a movie that boys recommended a lot of the time they were like i know it's a rom-com but it really doesn't suck that that's sort of what my memory of this movie is a lot of men sort of being like this is like a girl's film but it doesn't suck um because like the dude is wronged or something and Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and that was sort of the tone with which people talked about this movie at the time. And I do remember thinking, oh, this is feels like a different type of rom-com when I first mm-hmm. watched it. And it was kind of heartbreaking to be watching it now because I was watching it. And I, I do remember thinking that Tom was really dreamy and all that. And this time when I watched it, I just thought, you're not listening. You're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just had almost no, like positive associations with that guy like I didn't really I don't know I just remember I I didn't have like the strongest emotions at the time but I I really enjoyed it and it just didn't do it for me this time around I'm not sure Mm. but again I do not remember at all that it starts off with calling a woman a bitch Mm. not at all I thought we could talk about this movie a little bit because of the time it came out, uh, which I also like, I think I talked to you, Lily, about this, that I completely guessed wrong of when it came out. Like, oh, I yeah. out of guess 2009. I was like, maybe 2005 or like, I don't know. I just assumed that it was a lot older, maybe. But um, it was known at the time as like really original because of the nonlinear structure and because the ending was about not finding the one like... Mm-hmm. that they don't get together and i do remember in the trailer at the time it also said like this is not a love story mm-hmm. um and it was sort of i think because of the time that it was made and it was sort of it came after bridget jones diary my ba- a big fat greek wedding made in manhattan how to lose a guy in 10 days something's got to give 40 year old virgin so the proposal the wedding planner and stuff it sort of came out after a lot of rom-coms where the point of the movie is always that they're going to get together in the end Mm-hmm. and there were very few movies where they didn't sort of have that as the ending one of the ones that are a little bit older is uh, My Best Friend's Wedding mm-hmm. and also during the 2000s you had Forgetting Sarah Marshall those are sort of like some of the few movies that I found that were before where they didn't end up together in the end 
There were a lot of different things in the movie that I sort of remember from the 2009 era. There was a lot of like um, misogyny in the film in Five Hundred Days of Summer, like uh, "Don't be a pussy." The sister says to him, which is sort of like this idea of like misogyny is okay as long as it's, that comes from a female character. Yeah. Um, they talked about how uh, Summer is essentially a dude a lot of the time, mm-hmm. which okay. After this movie, there were a couple of movies that I found that did have, like, the idea of, like, the woman being the one with commitment issues, like the backup plan with Jennifer Lopez. Easy A was a completely different type of rom-com because it was so um, sex-oriented. Also, pre-read text because it was based on the Scarlet Letter, technically, Mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the switch, which was about the idea that someone switched a sperm sample and then the woman got impregnated with, like, uh, not the sperm that she sort of thought she was going to get impregnated with and how they sort of still sort of become a family in the end. Um, Friends with Benefits and No Strings Attached, I thought were also very interesting because those are both movies about couples saying like, we're just going to have sex, we're not going to have any commitment. But in those two movies, both of the partners, like there's always like a moment in those movies when like one of them falls for the other, but it's sort of less about, it almost seems like Five Hundred Days of Summer is like a drama version of those two films because those two movies were much more about like, oh, we're not on the same page and then they end up falling for each other anyway. I also wanted to mention Don John, which was kind of funny because that's a movie I watched and then completely forgot about for some reason. But uh Joseph Gordon-Levitt, after Five Hundred Days of Summer, made his own movie which was about him and Scarlett Johansson. His character is, is like addicted to porn and Scarlett Johansson is addicted to rom-coms and they don't um like they start dating and stuff, but it just doesn't fulfill him because he's so addicted to porn. And it was sort of like comparing like unrealistic expectations in relationships mm. based on the media we consume about sex and relationships. Yeah. I've not rewatched that movie though, since it came out. So I can't really tell you like, much about it because I don't remember that much about it. Did that come out before or after this film? After. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Because yeah. I mean, that's kind of what this film is about in a sense as well. It's about yeah. like working in a card factory and sort of like your well, it's about <laughs> social scripts and about expectations mm-hmm. and love, um, and about like not living up to reality. Yeah. Would you say Sorry, that there's you. a bit of a reversal of the uh, masculine and the feminine roles, and that it will be the guy who is the um the heartbroken one in the end yeah whereas usually we tend to have those narratives who is acting as the asshole sort of and perhaps that's why it struck a chord with so many of your um, male peers as well who were like i think so i think so i think like a lot of dudes were like yeah this sucks when i'm broken up with (laughs) exactly like it does happen to us too but that's interesting yeah because it is like tom is like because it's usually it's like the female character who like wants to find love and it's sort of like I want the one and I'm like I want commitment and it's sort of like those roles are kind of switched in this um yeah I think it's interesting yeah. because they are and then they're also completely not because of the way that she's being portrayed mm. it's just sort of yeah. this idea of like, reducing the masculine to like wanting to bang as many chicks as possible and then sort of just attributing that to someone else and having the feminine being sort of reduced to wanting commitment and at the same time she's also not depicted as the person who is fucking around quite a great deal in the movie, right? I mean, when they talk about her exes, she has like three exes that she mentions there that she was in just a couple of relationships and then she ends up getting engaged to someone, but she is not depicted depicted as anybody who is, you know, screwing around. And it also turns out she was honest about what she wanted from the very beginning on, so she was never deceiving him in any sort of way. As, uh, as being mentioned to Tom. Yeah. I think that's kind of the funny bit about like how many dudes especially like misremember that bit of it. <laughs> and it is that thing as well where all the male characters are saying like, oh, she's a super skank, like kind of coming up yeah. with these like kind of backstories for her of being like, oh, she's just screwing someone at the gym. And even like his sister who's like, well, he's, she's going to be screwing someone from Norway or whatever. And sort of all this kind of talking around Summer that's sort of like not really reflected in what you see about her, but then you don't see that much. So it is just a lot of kind of like here saying what you hear from other people that sort of informs how people think about this character. She's completely defined almost like there's so few things you learn about her from her own point of view. Most of what she's sort of made out of is the perspective of other people onto her. Like she doesn't really exist as a viewpoint as much as most other characters in, in the movie do. 
Yeah. yeah, we never know what drives her, really. We never know why she even starts that job at the uh, greeting card company. We don't know what she's what she does after her resignation, really. Like her dreams, her wishes, her desires, anything. So I wanted to talk about the rom-com for a second, so the concept of a rom-com. So I don't ever remember, like, someone sitting me down and, like, explaining to me what a rom-com is. It was just sort of like a quote-unquote female genre that existed and that, like, I was supposed to like. And I do think that rom-coms overall sort of do give us sort of heteronormative expectations of what we're supposed to sort of want in relationships. It's always like you have to meet cute, you meet someone, you fall for them, you sort of have like a little bit of issues in the beginning and then you sort of talk it out and then everything sort of ends with a wedding or with kids or with both. And like, obviously like every movie doesn't do this at the exact same way or something, but there's always this, yeah, there you always have like friends and stuff who like seem to care very much about you meeting someone, which is something I've never experienced in real life. Um <laughs> I don't know. I just like friends of mine are like happy for me if I meet someone, but I've never had like a friend who's like, you know, like the best friend trope in like rom coms. It's always like you really need to get married, or like you need really need to find someone before you hit thirty, or like you haven't had sex in six months. Oh my god, what are you gonna do? Or something like that. I've never experienced that in real life because most people have like so much stuff going on in their own time. <laughs> and no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah and it's just sort of this like, this expectations of because a lot of these movies are very much heterosexual cis normative heteronormative but also metanormative so the idea sorry i keep wanting to say the word and i always in my head i always hear tomato a metanormative <laughs> Imagine normativity is this idea that we are sort of destined to find someone to fall in love with. And that's sort of like a goal that is like an expectation in life that you need to hit at some point. And not that everybody just doesn't desire that necessarily. I was just going to say, with all those, so we've got all these kind of rom-com tropes and sort of like like the kind of expectations of heteronormativity, which then in other ways it just reinforces more because it sort of has like kind of like spots of sort of like kind of ignorance or just like kind of not seeing kind of when it's like re- reinforcing something perhaps because that bit at the beginning again that we talked about there's only two kinds of people in the world it feels very <laughs> like satirical to me like i'm like i think the film knows that it's sort of mocking this idea of like and it sort of starts off with that kind of like slightly mocking voiceover and then kind of goes into that sort of like romanticized like picturesque view of summer as sort of like the kind of dream girl with the sort of like playing around with the aspect ratio and sort of going into that kind of like black and white sort of like 1950s sort of like romanticized aesthetic. Um, and um, you kind of have this sort of, in some ways it's sort of breaking down those expectations. Um, and you've also got like in, when they're in the Ikea and they're like sort of playing with that kind of idealized image of like love and sort of like the kind of 1950s housewife like kind of playing house in this sort of like make-believe world. Um, and it's kind of showing this thing as a performance rather than like a reality. I thought it was actually quite neat and quite interestingly done. I would say the same uh, notion would apply to that one bit that they show earlier when they um, mention the amount of double takes that she tends to get, um, how she increased the sales of a Bell and Sebastian album because she had a quote of them <laughs> in her yearbook entry and um, yeah, that she ended up triplicating the um the, the sales at the um, ice cream parlor she worked at in, in college or something like that. <laughs> I mean, that is just gross and distorted, I would say, and amplified on purpose. Mm. I feel like that's super interesting in the movie, I agree, but I feel like I always sort of, the thing where it's lacking for me is the fact that it doesn't go beyond that. Like, it always seems to, like, like the whole movie seems to, like, point out stuff where it's like, isn't that interesting? And I'm like, yeah, tell me more about that. And then it doesn't. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, you see the 1950s hair. You see, like, her sort of dressing like 1960s, 1950s. And that seems to just sort of go on. And then I'm like, yeah, but, like, what does that mean, though? Like, you can't just point out stuff to me and then, like, not go deeper in that. And even that bit is completely just framing her based on... Like, people wanted to buy music based on a quote that she put into a yearbook. People wanted to buy ice cream because they thought, they thought she was attractive. People, like, there's double takes, like you said, Loretta, because of people, the pe- people look at her because of the way she looks to them. She looks, like, she doesn't look at them, though. 
Like you never see that bit. Yeah. Like the only thing mm-hmm. I thought was interesting about the back, uh, the the flashbacks was the bit where she said she liked she was influenced by her parents' divorce, and she was mm-hmm. influenced by the fact that she loved her hair because it allowed her to sort of take control in a way because she could cut it off. That I felt like were the only things I know about this person beyond like her undes- not uh, not existing desire to be in a relationship that actually came from her. Like something about her personality rather than what other people attributed to her personality. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think because you get snippets of Summer and you kind of get snippets of like what she's about. Um, and this is something that me and Anna, we were talking about earlier about kind of why people have like very different perceptions of this film. It's sort of like whose perspective do you side with? Do you side with Tom's or do you side with Summer's? Um, and because its story is like told from Tom's perspective, it sort of makes sense to sort of see Summer as the sort of the one in the. But then, I don't know like when I watch it, I'm like, well, no, obviously Tom's the asshole here. Like, obviously, like you know, it's easier to read it as sort of like um, a sort of subversion of that. Sorry, can you go into like what you mean by subversion of that? Sure. So again, as like a kind of film that's sort of set up as, or that I'd heard about as like kind of the anti rom com, and also as like the anti manic pixie dream. Do we want to go into the manic pixie dream girl now, or should we? come back to that later i don't know we can we can just go with it let's go with it okay so um a little bit of background so manic Pixie dream girls so i think, I think most people will probably know this trope but it's the sort of trope of this like um female character and so they sort of like come in they're sort of like kind of fun and quirky and they kind of inspire the male character to go off and like kind of fulfill their dreams and whatever and they don't really have anything going on with themselves and they don't really have like a story or um kind of any kind of character motivations outside of this male character um, and I think there's quite a lot of discourse around whether Summer is a Manic Pixie Dream Girl or whether she's like a deconstruction of or like a critique of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. So this term was coined in like 2007, I think. And obviously this film came out in 2009, but sort of very kind of contemporary um, and sort of like. And also the author of the trope, or like the person who came up with the trope, kind of like later rescinded it, but it was being used, being used to critique the actors rather than the trope itself and sort of like the creation of these sort of one dimensional characters. Um, and I think it's interesting in this film because it is so much from Tom's perspective, um, that it's sort of, it's like, if you take it on face value, which it sort of in kind of inclines you to do, like Summer is definitely the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, but then if you, if you dig or if you're like kind of like engaging with it more critically, she's not, but then is the film trying to make you do that? Like, I don't know, what, what do you guys think? Just in terms of that term, so, um, I think we can also connect this to like the male gaze and like how sort of certain terminology sort of gets into the mainstream and then sort of gets misattributed to certain things because manic pixie Mm -hmm. dream girl was a term that was used to describe the ideas. It was specifically like talking about uh, Kirsten Dunst in Elizabethtown, which is a movie that came out in 2005, which I've also seen and is horrible. But, (laughs) um, but it's this idea of like a woman who doesn't exist on her own as a character and doesn't really have any traits or character development or anything and literally just uh, exists to move the male character's plot forward and like inspire him to go for what he wants. And I think it's also interesting to sort of think about that in terms of like the male gaze, because when we talk mm-hmm. about the male gaze, we don't just talk about the fact that there is a man behind the camera or behind or in the director's chair. It's also the idea of like getting to the point where you get to sort of tell your version of a story is also just so skewed by patriarchy and white supremacy that the person who gets to be in that chair tends to be a white man because of that. So um I think many picks a dream girl because like you said, because it was sort of um rescinded sort of by the writer was because people then started criticizing people like Zoe Deschanel for like being a manic pixie dream girl in real life like this is an actress you don't know this person um the idea that she sort of the way that she portrays herself in media is her own business and she doesn't have to sort of live up to your narrative standards because this is not a character in a movie and that term then got sort of used to um yeah like criticize people that are a um, like act, uh, acting within this world of a patriarchal society and ra- rather than like criticizing screenwriters which was and directors mm-hmm. for picking up these uh, uh, screenplays which was the whole point actually um, so in terms of what you were asking like whether that's sort of what the movie sorry were you asking like whether that's whether you think that this is a manic pixie dream girl or whether it's just people sort of misunderstanding the script okay so first of all do you think do you guys think that Summer is a manic pixie dream girl or not? And like, why? I would say personally that she is because the movie doesn't 
give me enough about her to actually be interested in her as a person rather than me just constantly wondering, like, why doesn't the movie tell me anything about her? I think I don't think it's as simple as just saying that it mm. depicts summer as bad or like the depiction of summer as bad. I don't think it's that simplistic. I do think a lot of people misinterpret that a, a lot. But like if the movie was like the movie could use a lot of things that we could see in the background of things when we see her apartment, when we see different like moments when we just see her, there could be a lot more things that the movie could show us like it as in show don't tell where we could sort of, when we rewatch the film, sort of go like, oh, that's interesting. I never noticed that bit about her. But it sort of doesn't. So I do think it's a Manny Pixie Dream Girl in terms of the screenplay. Just not as much as people say it is, maybe. Yeah, I guess we would also <laughs> distinguish between the persona that is created around her and the person of Summer, right? Good point. Um, because, yeah, I would have a... I, I do get the sense that her whole performance... Is depicted as extremely polished. She never speaks. She is depicted as extremely witty, as always knowing how to impress people, how to always say the right thing. But then, um, perhaps you might not know. Like we don't get to know her beyond that persona. That's true. Yeah, I think it's like the film makes an effort to sort of draw attention to the fact that it's romanticizing summer. Like, again, with the sort of like opening shots of like the aspect ratio, the black and white, and then kind of like the things that you learn about her, like through like Tom's gaze in particular. And sort of like, I think in our notes, Anna, we think about her is that her favorite beetle is Ringo. Like, that's sort of like <laughs> the only bit of like information that we sort of like get about this character. Um, and it's sort of like you kind of get hints at certain points, I think, where the film sort of like hints that like we're not actually seeing Summer fully as she is like when they go and see the graduate and she's like crying and like Tom's like I don't really understand or let's go get pancakes and it's sort of like you kind of see that something's happening sort of what Tom's doing or like kind of perceptions but like because it's kind of told from Tom's perspective you you sort of like it's sort of like the layers are there but you don't get to see it as an audience member because that's not the perspective you're showing. Right you're mostly just getting Tom's reaction to um, Summer's actions that you don't yeah. get to see what, what uh, drove these actions in the first place and uh, the communication that is going in, on in the background. You just see the encounters as such told from Tom's perspective. Exactly. And because his perspective is so self-centered, like, he, again, there's that point where he's, they're, like, going to... Is it Millie's wedding? Um, they're going to, like, the wedding of the, their co-worker, and he's like, oh, I forgot you knew her. And she's like, yeah, we, we were together all that time. Like, <laughs> we're really great friends. And it's like, yeah, Tom, it wasn't just you at this workplace. Like, she had, like, a lot... She, it sort of hints at the fact that, like, no, Summer does have a life outside this character. And it sort of makes... It's like the film does make does mock Tom, and it sort of, I think, does draw attention to the fact that we are seeing Summer through this lens, and we are seeing Summer in this very, very one-dimensional way because it's told through Tom's perspective. But then, again, Anna, like you say, it's sort of like, then doesn't really give us that much. So it's sort of like, are you being subversive or aren't you? Like, what, what kind of, what are you trying to say here? And it's sort of like, kind of quite difficult sort of unpick that. Yeah. yeah. One moment that I also found particularly interesting, it was in the very beginning, I think it was um, the second sequence that they showed, where um, his sister is uh, riding her bike to his house to go see him when he's uh, throwing down the plates against the tiles, and when she's saying, it's Amanda all over again. Yeah. And we do get the hint mm. that this is a repetitive pattern for Tom, and this is not the first time where he was so... Yeah, I had that too. I was like, this is not the first time he's done this. Yeah, where he was so extremely intoxicated by someone, probably. But then we also do get the hint later on in the movie where he's at his sister's soccer game and she just tells him up front that you have broken up with girls. Girls have broken up with you before. And then he's like, no, but it's summer, it's different. And she's like, but how is that different? It's just because you got to experience it in that moment. But there is a strong um, allusion to the fact that this did probably happen and it will, and it's a recurring theme and it will happen again. Mm -hmm. 
sort of doing the same thing for me again, though, because it's like it's hinting in the very beginning that this has happened before, that this is a pattern that he's doing. And then when you like the mention the scene you mentioned just now will completely negate that as if that Amanda person never existed because the sister doesn't bring it up again. Like the sister could like go like, do you remember what you did when you were so into Amanda? Because that person just is never brought up again. Again, like this movie doesn't go into all the stuff that it sort of like it keeps putting stuff down, but doesn't pick it up again. Mm. And that's sort of what I think really frustrating. I guess the same thing happens during the blind date again. So apparently has <laughs> yeah. been an effort to set him up with a friend. And we don't know um, for how long that effort had been ongoing during these 500 days of summer, right? Like uh, when it started that they um, tried to set him up with her. And yeah, we just noticed from the very beginning that he is not even giving her a shot. Um, and just going straight to talking about summer without her having yeah. anything wrong and just trying to have a pleasant conversation with him. But he is still so intoxicated and um, stuck in summer. Yeah, and there's that really horrible bit, like, when she leaves and, like, he's really drunk and doing the karaoke and he's like, oh, she didn't look anything like summer anyway, waste oh. of time. Oh, that was so gross. Oh. And it's also, okay, so I was reading this on Wikipedia, I think it was on Wikipedia, but, like, this, I think apparently... Um, this like um, costume designer for the film um, kind of tried to make it's like the color blue is quite important and it's like they tried to make like summer be the only character in blue in like any sort of scene that she was in and then when you do see bursts of blue like when they do the kind of great um, uh, the flash mob scene and like everyone's in blue and it's sort of, like blue is like the main color because it's all about like summer um, and then uh, but like she's sort of generally the what, only one in blue most of the time um, but then Alison is also like in a blue dress in that scene as well and it's sort of like oh it's just god it, yeah it's and again that that moment it's sort of hinting that like tom's a very limited perspective and that like tom is the unreasonable one because allison literally points out well she did say up front that she did just want to be friends and she didn't want anything serious and then he's like let's go do some karaoke um and it's sort of i don't know it's like you're like are you being clever film or are you not really committing to this bit like if most audience members because anna you were saying that at the time a lot of um, sort of male audience members kind of really sided with Tom. Were like, you know, Summer's like the one in the wrong. Uh, Tom's like a great guy, like, and that's sort of like the kind of dynamic they have with the film. And if that's sort of like what most people are taking away from this film, then maybe you're doing this slightly too subtly. I don't know. I don't know what you think. I felt like when I rewatched it now, I was hoping for that. I was hoping that the movie was going to give me just more than I expected and that the reason I didn't get it at the time was because I was, quote unquote, just young and un, sort of unknowing about these kind of things. And that I just sort of, as like someone growing up in a patriarch, is just sided with the dude for no reason. But um I was hoping for more from the movie in terms of Summer's perspective of anything. Mm-hmm. And it just it felt really flat in that perspective for me this time. That's sort of the thing. Like, I don't quite understand. I don't know how you two feel about this. Maybe we could talk about this a little bit now. Like, she kept saying, like, um, even when they break up, like, she says, like, I'm, I, you're still my best friend. And I was like, I find that kind of, I mean, I'm not sure, like, how common, like, polyamorous, kind of language was at the time in terms of mainstream but I did find the word friend for this kind of strange because I was like she doesn't say or like even like the term of being in a quote unquote open relationship like I don't know how common that was as a term either but it was thinking the fact that she kept saying like oh like let's be friends or we're friends that's what we're just doing or whatever I did find that language kind of misleading on her part now I was like why aren't you just like like, why is, what's the friend bit of this? I don't understand. Because he's not listening to you. You're not really friends. Yeah. He's just sort of trying to get more and more close to you um, romantically. But, like, how are you friends? Like, what is... Because, again, like, because... A bit, again, that's sort of because it's limited to Tom's perspective. But, like, wouldn't you be talking to your friend mm, at some point about, yeah. like, what you want? Like, whether you want to keep at this job? Because she keeps saying that she has no respect for this business either. So... But, yeah, I just found the terminology friends really strange. Or, like, even there was a scene when they're sitting in a car after he's talked to his sister and, like, his sister has been telling him, like, you need to, like, communicate clearly what you want. You know, like, you talk normally with your younger sister. And and she just, and they sit in the car, Summer and Tom are, and he goes, well, what's going on? And she goes, well, nothing, nothing's going on. 
And I was like, again, is that because Tom's perspective is so limited? Or because, again, that's a weird thing to say to someone you're sleeping with. Yeah. And then there's this one moment at the pancake place. Mm. She is breaking up with him. And he acts super surprised about this. And she's like, but all we do is argue. And he goes like, that is bullshit. <laughs> I would say that as a spectator, we aren't even able to tell if all they did was argue, right? Because of um, the jumble and yeah, jumbled order of, of scenes of their family days together. Yeah, when did they argue? <laughs> <laughs> that one time when Tom hit a guy because oh, yeah, he was upset that he was... I don't know, literally nothing to do with Summer just because his masculinity was slightly threatened by yeah. him that one time. I don't know, I just kept getting, the, the one thing that I would was like mad at Summer about in this film was truly the fact that she kept calling it friends. I was like, even if I was like annoyed that I wasn't getting from you what I want, I would also be annoyed that you were using the term friends because that's not what I do with friends. Yeah, but yeah, again, it's sort of that miscommunication between the two characters, but it's difficult to kind of tell how little Summer communicates because you get the kind of very, lim- again, because you've got Tom's very limited perspective. Um, but I think you could kind of very easily come to the defense of Sarah and be like, oh no, she's completely in the right, like Tom's completely in the wrong, like she's like a very, you know, if you listen to her, she actually makes a lot of sense, blah, blah, blah. But like, I think also she is a flawed character and that's kind of important as well. Like if we want to say, if we want to make the case that this is like anti-thematic people, girl, how is she also kind of like a flawed character in her own right? Like, because she's like quite selfish. And again, that's not me saying that like she shouldn't have her own like desires and things, but like she does, you know, like make decisions like to kind of like quote unquote lead him on when she's like going out with another guy and like doesn't kind of communicate that with him and then um kind of invites him to a party where he she knows that like her partner's gonna be and sort of like kind of complicated thing where it's sort of like that's not necessarily wrong but like also you know it's sort of like more complex than that and like maybe she isn't thinking about his feelings although he's thinking purely about his own feelings so like you know it's sort of like more complex she's not like a kind of like perfect character that's always putting his feelings first which is sort of like why maybe she's not the manic piece of girl as well i know what you think about that i think that when like the one thing that i really disliked about her was when she invited him to the party like someone asked him what do you do tom and she goes well he's he should be a really great architect and i thought that's such a mean thing to say like to a group of strangers when you have some like your ex sitting there like Mm -hmm. Like, putting them on the spot, just say some random crap, like, oh, we met here, um, we both really like music or something. Like, why are you putting this person on the spot in front of strangers? I found that really rude. Yeah, I um, did get the feeling, though, that because of these um, childhood videos that um, the movie shows in the very beginning, that they are trying to make an attempt to um, show how they both ended up where they are at the mm-hmm. sort of as a behavioral, psychological aspect, I guess, or as a driving factor um, that because of their respective experiences, like um, Tom being overly exposed to sad British pop songs and Summer always having been this very cool girl, this is how they both ended up in these positions, like Summer sort of winning this over Tom. I don't have anything like that interesting to say about like the Euro- European movie inserts that are made in this movie because I'm generally not sure what that even though I know the films themselves like the the classics and stuff but I'm just not sure what that was meant to represent other than the fact that he sort of sees himself as being like a character in a movie but also again doesn't seem to understand the point of movies like Loretta said the flashback you sort of see him like him being influenced by a sad British music and just, I guess, watching movies and then sort of, like, inserting himself into sort of the perspective of them. But I wasn't sure, like, as movie makers making 500 Days of Summer, what was that meant to tell me? Mm-hmm. Like, I... Movie references, or... Yeah, because, like, it's like, oh, he's playing chess with death. And I was like, yeah, uh-huh. And? Like, <laughs> well, what does that have to do with this film? <laughs> I think it's partly, like, it's just the melodrama the complete melodrama of tom as a character 
he's like I, my life is sort of like very classic French film or whatever. Like my life is like I'm playing chess with an angel. Like you have the romanticized camera. You have sort of like him having like a very literalist reading of the Graduate. You have like you know it's all the it's like sort of the, all these kind of like the cultural tropes, sort of like narratives um, of like love and of like kind of grief um, that are sort of like depicted in these films and that he's sort of like kind of referring to to sort of like explain his own like sadness and things but like isn't necessarily doing the best reading of he's sort of but he's sort of still inserting himself into that narrative it's literally him inserting himself as like the main character into like all of these like different films and different homages he's like this explains my life my life is a movie this is the movie that i feel like my life is today um and it's sort of like i'm gonna hang out with a sad clown because i'm feeling sad kind of thing um, so I think it's sort of like, I think it does play with, play around with sort of like kind of tropes of film quite well. Um, cause, cause the film is sort of like, this is like Tom's story and then it's sort of like Tom exploring films through the film as well. No, so I do have the feeling that the construction of his persona is then also put against the backdrop of the wider context they are finding themselves in in the city of LA, like they do make a few references to the city as such from mentioning it as one of the most beautiful places in the world. But then um, the perspective we get of the city in itself is also quite limited. Like we get mm-hmm. this one image of Los Angeles Plaza, but it's not actually talking about, um, say, you know, their exact whereabouts in the city. Like where it is that they're living, you know, they're experiencing other than their story, like what is going on between the two of them. Mm. It is fair to see beyond that. That's really interesting because, yeah, I noticed like when I was watching, I was watching it with my parents like to start off with and we were like, where is this set? Because like it doesn't sort of make it explicit, sort of like they don't say it until like quite late on to the film. And we were sort of like, are they in like Boston or something? Like, where are they? Like, so I was like, are they supposed to be in New York? Because they're like, it's like one of the best cities in the world or whatever. Um, And it took me like, yeah, it was until like at least a few, like at least 20 minutes into the film before they actually say where they are. But you don't really see the very key like LA landmarks. Which I think is interesting as well, because Tom is like an architect, so it's sort of like this film is sort of his fantasy. And like you were saying, it's sort of like his world and sort of like he's like constructing it and you're sort of seeing these shots of buildings and things. And so it's about like it being this sort of small picture rather than this big picture. It is extremely limited. I mean, who would cycle in L.A. in the middle of the night and especially a minor? <laughs> yeah, where the hell did that yeah. go? Come from? Yeah. I refuse to believe that. Like that's everything I've ever heard about L.A. It's that it's shit in terms of traffic. Like who would send? Like I'm assuming his do- his uh, sister lives somewhere like a little bit too in terms of um, I don't know suburbs. I know L.A. is huge, but mm. the idea of like this girl just like biking in the middle of the night to her brother's um, like apartment in very much the city bit of it just makes no sense. I think it's interesting what you both have said in terms of both the depiction of the city, but also in terms of summer, because I just realized this is actually quite a modern problem we do now with like everyone, which is that he reduces summer also to a narrative device. Like she's Mm. not a real person. She's just a narrative device in his movie. Like you said, Lily, like she's just one, like she's just a character. She's not a person. And that's why when she breaks up with him, he's like, Wait, 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 you have no autonomy here. <laughs> yeah. I write the script. <laughs> yeah, I would yeah like, but he's... Sorry, no, you go, yeah. I'd just like to insert um, a small anecdote of it there, because I have been to LA a few years ago when I was studying in the US, and I actually went to visit the places where they um, shot these different scenes. Oh, and I was in Plaza, and it's <laughs> an extremely noisy place with a lot of traffic <laughs> around it. It's not nearly as quiet as it is depicted in the movie. And the same thing goes for when they're walking around the arts district. It's nothing like that. I mean, in terms of noise, in terms of, um, you know, them being or seeming so secluded from everybody, <laughs> they're just not being a lot of crowds. And, um, yeah, her place is in Koreatown as well. Um, and I found it interesting that we, you know, just got to see her place on the inside, never anything that's around it. His apartment is apparently in the arts district, which would be like another one hour drive or so. But still, we um, get this image of her running to his house in the middle of the night after their argument, soaked in rain. rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're so walkable. So I find it interesting how they're constructing this microcosm within the movie. 
Yeah. Mm. Also, they um just so you know they removed the bench since then because too many fans of the movie like went to that bench, and <laughs> so they removed it. Um, <laughs> no, that's super interesting. Like the fact that even the sound becomes sort of reduced to what the narrative wants to, to show it to you. So it, because I think that's why I thought for such a long time that this movie took place because it was the same as you, Lily. I was like, this is L.A. I thought this was like New York or something because I just uh, kept thinking like, this doesn't look like L.A. to me. Like this seems too quiet and too too much like in terms of like parks and trees and yeah, just the whole aspect of like walking everywhere. I find it interesting that the movie is also so centered on the city space, which I can imagine also has to do with um, Tom's ambitions as an architect. Like, I could imagine that, that that is also done deliberately, mm -hmm. as if he was willfully just inhabiting that space and not, you know, taking this from a wider context, but if this was his whole universe. I also thought it was interesting because I know nothing about architecture, but the fact that he sort of said, like, if I built the city this way, again, about, like, who has the autonomy here? He was like, I would move this here and I would move that here. And I just kept watching this thinking, that's not how buildings work. <laughs> <laughs> like, you like I, you can't just, like, remove buildings and, like, get rid of a parking space here and stuff or whatever. But, like, you can't just, like, move buildings everywhere. Like, that's... <laughs> Like, and that makes no sense to me. And I was like, you're really just shaping, um, like, the world around you to sort of what you would like it to look like. And it's also the skyline, right? It's the most exciting part. He's like, I'm just going to, yeah. like, focus on this one aspect. Because it's not even, because it's like, you get a very limited, like, kind of feel of LA and then you're just looking up. And it's sort of like, if you think about the skyscraper, it's like kind of like reaching up to the sky. It's like this kind of beautiful monument. And you're just looking at this sort of like the ideal thing um, and like the pinnacle which is sort of like what he does is that he like idealizes summer. Yeah. He idealizes what like love and a relationship is. And he's sort of like, I just want like the absolute best without sort of kind of trying looking. And he's just like kind of so focused on that, that he's like ignoring everything else. Yeah, He's not focused on the idea yeah. of that. That's a building. You can't just like move. A, like it's the thing of like, it's either like hyper focused on like this one person or just sort of like zooming out way too far. Right. Like what you said mm -hmm. about the skyline, like he's never like looking at, like something yeah. at like the correct distance. Like he only ever zooms out so much that he doesn't really see what's going on, or he zooms in way too close that he doesn't really understand like what's going around around him, around the situation that he's in. But yeah. And this zoom again occurs again I think at this extremely low point when he is drawing these cityscapes against the blackboard and he thinks that will help him land a job as an architect. Like again creating his city with own within the confines of his own apartment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's focusing on... He, he's taking some time out to focus on his vision of things. Oh, <laughs> <Tom>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that, he doesn't do that enough. So we've already talked a bit about the camera, but I think um, the kind of the way that they use, like, split screen, I think is quite interesting. And sort of how they use that to set up, like, setting it up as, like, they're the one and then they're not the one, and the nonlinear structure as well. In terms of like the nonlinear structure, I was thinking, is this, was this device used to make, like, because this is like the best way to tell the story? Or is it because if you really told it for, like from a linear point of view, this movie wouldn't be interesting? Because if, no, because even now when I watch it, I'm like, I'm watching a really weird dude. Like, like he never stalks her. Like I found that kind of a weird line, but like he like falls for someone, gets obsessed with her, slut shames her like projects all of these like misogynist ideas mm -hmm. onto her and then they, he eventually manages to sort of get her like she seems to be interested at least at fucking him and they do hang out and then she breaks up with him and he completely falls apart and you're like if you think about it from that point of view you're like dear god what a douchebag like <laughs> but I, I was just wondering like is like the only reason why this movie sort of feels like original is, is it because the structure of it isn't linear yeah, if you think about it, 500 days is also a really long time, right? like almost two years. I was looking at this and I was like, I was at some point when we were writing down notes, I was like, wait, how many months is that? And I was like, it's 16 months. And I was like, that's a long time to like not never listen to a person. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think part of what it's doing is kind of playing with expectations as well, because like you start yeah. off in the film with like the kind of opening thing is you see them on the bench at the very end. And it's sort of like what you'd expect from what you'd expect from a rom com would be that like you know those two have gotten together like the ring on the finger is like them like being a couple like engaged that kind of look that they share is sort of like one of love and un- like understanding of like love and that's like kind of like the ending that you're expecting um, yeah. and then um, kind of in the process of like kind of getting to that ending you're sort of jumping around it's like quite disrupted. Um, and that's sort of like the disruption of kind of the narrative that you get you get given by Tom um, and sort of like the expectations that you kind of bring um, and the expectations that he, he has. So yeah, just, I forgot to write this down, I guess, but there was a movie that this was based on. So they had written the script and they had, um, they randomly watched, I think it was a French film and they sort of realized that the idea of like, it's called 58, God damn it. But it's, like, based on a movie where they also, like, broke apart a story into, like, different bits of it and sort of pulled them out of order. And mm-hmm. that's when they sort of realized, I think this would make the script really great if we told it out of order as opposed to just the story of, um, like, two people, fall, um, like, starting to hang out and then, like, not. So if they had aligned the individual bits in a different order, do you think the story might have come across in a different way as well, that it would have been capable of telling an entirely different story. Do you think the narrative outcome might have been changed by that specific order that they chose? Or do you think there would have been wiggle room to tell a different story? I think if they would have showed every single aspect of him being problematic in the beginning, and then maybe also like a little bit different score, this could have made a really good horror mo- horror movie. Do you know what I mean? Like it could have been so creepy if you just show him being like weird and like, like, listen, every moment when he's just staring at her, playing music loudly in an open office, God, how annoying. Um, just imagine just like playing the, the Smith and just like staring at her every time she leaves the room and then just like, just really creepy music. This would have made a very different tone of film. <laughs> and then when you see her like starting to date him, you would just sit in the theater and be like, run, <laughs> run away, please. But interestingly, you mentioned earlier that um, you were more sympathetic to Tom than you watched it when you were a bit younger. And I think the movie is making an attempt to tell it from the sort of cutesy perspective. Oh, look at this dream boy who's just dreaming about his, the woman of his dreams the whole time and he's just not getting her. And now you see it so differently. I think that was like the, this, I mean, I was a teenager and I was just seeing this like, sensitive dude like you know what i mean he wasn't like the big built muscly guy he was into a british band that i at that time hadn't heard of and i was like oh he's so cultured or something like you know he mean like he's someone who thinks about music and art and stuff and i was like oh so cute and joseph gordon levitt is a very attractive person i just thought it was so cute and this time i was just i wasn't i wasn't taken by the character of summer this time around either Mm -hmm. But that's because the movie doesn't show me anything about that character. But this time around, I did sort of just think, I don't know. I just didn't have that moment of thinking he was cute because his personality just bothered me so much this time around that I just sort of didn't have that. Um, Willie, do you think like if they sort of um, not told it in order, but a different structure would have sort of also told a different story? I think, yeah, I think what it does with sort of the cross-cutting is because it like kind of c- contrasts those key moments. And so you sort of, you, s- you see the reference back before you see the, like, the fir- the original, like, moment. And it's like, honey, the sink's broken. And you're like, what? And when um, he says, like, you know, I'm happy, aren't you happy? And sort of how, like, they're sort of, like, contrasting these two moments in their relationship. Um, but, like, by telling it out of order... I don't know, I guess, because you don't see the context until um, you you kind of watch on later into the film. And so I guess, no. I think the thing that like gets you intrigued into the film is because it starts out as the breakup, you do sort of want to know, like, how did you break up? Because it starts with him. It starts with his friends. His friends are the ones telling us uh, on screen what happened. You know, do you want to tell us about this? And then you sort of get like the story starting to begin. 
and then it cuts back. You know what I mean? Like it sets up like interest in the viewer from that perspective. Mm, definitely. But again, portraying him as a douchey person in the way he <laughs> friends, like how he's talking to them. <laughs> They're really just trying to help him out. He's like, you have no dating experience whatsoever. You've been dating this one girl since 1997. <laughs> and you were only dating that one girl in high school for like three hours. It's just such a condescending <laughs> way to treat your friends. Who are yeah. Just, just like, yeah. why are you his friend? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, like, that's a weird thing to say to someone who's been in a relationship for a very long time. Like, what do you know? (laughs) Exactly. Do you want to jump to rom-com tropes now? Sure. It's kind of interesting that the meet-cute doesn't happen for a second because the first time he sees her is because she's doing her job. She's, like, passing something to his boss. And then, or some to someone in the conference room, and the meet cute sort of only happens a little bit later, and mm-hmm. it is because it's her being intrigued by something about him, which is that she recognizes the song that he's playing on his um on his headphones in the elevator, mm-hmm. and that's really like the meet cute, so even that is like subverted a little bit, the fact that she knows who the Smiths are, and I was thinking that's kind of interesting because that is a very important part of a lot of rom coms is the meet cute. The fact that he works in like a greeting card company, so characters in rom-coms often have very cutesy jobs. Women are a lot of the time art curators of some sort. I feel like that's a job that women have a lot. Like they seem to like uh, be collecting right. art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but the fact that he works in a greeting card company, there's also just the idea that men who don't believe in romance work in jobs that have a lot to do with romance. So Jack Nicholson, for example, like as a character of wrote romance novels, but the whole point of his character at the end, that movie was that he just didn't give a shit about anyone and he was the rudest person alive. And then he would just go back to his like typewriter and like write the most romantic kissing scenes and sex scenes mm. and stuff. And then he would just, someone would knock on his door and he'd be like, who the fuck is that? Like that was kind of the, 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 the where the humor in that came from. Tom has best friends, which is super important in rom coms because again, I, like I said before, you have to have friends who are more invested in what you do in your relationship than they seem to be in their own lives. Because you never meet that uh, Matthew Gray Goobler's girlfriend character. You just see Matthew Gray Goobler. I think it's interesting because they are his best friends, but they're both also huge assholes, I would say. They're like friends in rom-coms meant to have good advice. I think that role in this movie is sort of moved to his sister. She's like mm-hmm. the one like actually giving him like good advice about like, hey, communicate what you need. Um, just because she likes the same crap you do doesn't mean you're soulmates. And I also felt like this movie sort of borrowed from When Harry Met Sally a little bit with, like, the black and white shots. I mean, in, black, in Harry Met Sally, it wasn't black and white, but these, like, um, talking heads of the two, like, friends and his boss talking about how they um, either met someone or didn't meet someone. And God, I can't remember the friend's name now. But he said, as long as she's cute and she's willing, which was, I, I'm so certain that that was written without any intention of like showing how disgusting that is. And Matthew Gray Google's character mm-hmm. talks about the girl that he was dating since 1997, saying that like she's, she's the perfect girl for him because she's real, even though she doesn't fulfill his like fantasy of what the perfect girl would look like. And yeah. that again, in my opinion, was shown as like being something that we're meant to think is really romantic. Like, he forgives her for not having the body that he desires. Like, the perfect body that he would prefer. Mm-hmm. Which, again, as a, can I just say, as a queer person, mm-hmm. I've never in my entire life looked at a woman's body or a person's body or anyone of any gender and thought, you know what you should do? Like, <laughs> like That's not my body, do you know what I mean? Like, I've never sort of felt entitled to, like, tell someone to change something like that. Yeah. Thought, that's such a weird thing to just say about, like, someone's tits, like... <laughs> yeah, I was saying she had a more bodacious rack. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so like I don't even know if that language feels two thousand and nine. Like it feels it feels like nineties. Like it's like bodacious, bodacious rack. I don't know. <laughs> it's, just like... it's like I don't know. It's like the way that uh, Pamela Anderson was described a lot, right? Like it's yeah, it does feel very nineties. Which yeah. I think is another kind of sorry to keep keep on with the rom com tropes, but like yeah, sure. I feel like they've kind of gone with a sort of like um, kind of t- the kind of like timeless sort of feel that they're going for because they get like in terms of like the kind of like the costume design, it's like somewhere sort of like kind of like 1950s kind of like or like she's got like the 1950s hair and 1960s haircut. 
Um, but also like you've got kind of like clothing that sort of like feels like it could be kind of in between like the 90s to like 2010s. It sort of I think is another reason why this film is quite hard to place. Like I didn't think it came out in 2009. I thought it was earlier because it just sort of feels quite. It's kind of kind of going through timeless. Although there is that great bit where like they're both playing like Wii tennis on this like tiny UK, and I'm like, aha, yes, it is like 2009, and um, I do love a bit of Wii tennis. But it's sort of like that kind of dates it to a very <laughs> particular time. But yeah. I think what I don't know um, whether Loretta can back me up on this, but I thought the vest and the tie, the way that Tom dressed at least, did feel very 2009 to me. Oh, it there did. Was... Yeah, <laughs> the sneakers as well. The uh, oh yeah, the sneakers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really did. And the messenger bag. Oh yeah! Oh my god! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe it's just because it's like that was my child. So I'm just like, that's just timeless, like the universal style um, of, yeah, Converse and tie. Do you know how many messenger bags I bought and was like, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to look like a normal person. I'm going to like act like I'm going to dress the way that people should dress. And just I just hate it because I love having backpacks because it just, you know, it leaves my arms free. And just messenger bags are just always like bothersome across like your front and just and I'm sorry, this is so random. <laughs> I just always was like, oh, I'm going to be that person who has like a messenger bag and goes everywhere. And it was just, there was never enough like space to put stuff in. And it just never, I don't know, <laughs> just my attempt to sort of dress normal as a teenager. It did not work. I forgot to look this up, but when Matthew Greg Ubler's um, ca- um, character goes into his apartment and he's like, you were essentially stalking her. And then he asked her, like, how much has gone down between him and Summer. He says a blowjob. And then he says hum job. And I still don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like before we all had, like, Wi-Fi on our phones, there was also a huge thing of, like, people just mention certain sex things. Like, she refers to one of her ex-boyfriend as the Puma. And then everybody just pretends that they know what that is. And then everybody's <laughs> like, yeah, I've done that. I know exactly what that means. And you're like, I have no idea. What's going on? <laughs> and the anal girl thing too. Oh yeah. So I will say I don't know. Did fun. you find that funny or did you no. find that annoying? I don't know. I'm I'm sort of going back and forth. Yeah, it was sort of over the top for me. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time watching it, I found it kind of funny. Second time around, less so. Yeah, I do remember yeah. that bit being in the trailer as well. Maybe that's why it sort of didn't land for me. I'm oh, it's sure. the trailer. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I did want to talk about the homophobia. I don't have much to say about it, to be honest, because it's just so basic in a way. It's like, I don't know, like I've had that once in my life where I walked down the street and someone called me a homo and it sort of felt so out of place. And like, I was like, what is this, 1995? Like, <laughs> like their homophobia was so basic in a way, like it wasn't. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't intentional. It was so, like, unintentional, just basic homophobia that was so common back then. I mean, it's still very common now. But just every time, the idea that Tom is someone who expresses emotions was reacted to by his friends is like, you sound really gay. And then the other friend going, you really do. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or in that bar scene where um, Summer mentions that she doesn't like being anybody's anything. And she likes to be on her own, and yeah. somebody asks her if she's a lesbian, and she's like, no, I'm not. And he also asks, like, in that tone, he's like, are you a lesbian? And I was like, like, he's meant to be like, it's meant to be like, oh, I'm just, like, joking and stuff. And you're like, that's not a normal thing to ask someone when they say I don't date people. <laughs> yeah. Does she say hi? Hey, instead of hi, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> she's a lesbian, yeah. Yeah. Also, in the beginning, yeah. you have um, them like uh, presenting different cards and stuff, and his friend represents the other Mother's Day card, which I just thought. Like, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about. Th- yeah, sorry, no, you yeah, go, no, you no, go. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I think it's really it's funny because it opens the film literally opens with them saying the nuclear family is dead, and then like opens with this, and then it's like other Mother's Day, and I mean it's like a joke, but then it's kind of like you know like oh you know like this is the anti rom com like things are going to end up differently, but then the whole film is like framed around like Millie's marriage basically because it's like the kind of first time they meet is at this like engagement party, and then they sort of like almost get together like they of. At the, towards the end she like gets married so like at the same time as it's sort of like opening up as like you know the nuclear family is dead and like these two characters aren't going to get together it still ends it ends with an engagement between two characters and also it sort of like is framed by this sort of like underlying marriage plot that's happening as well which i think is just kind of 
it's, it's, it's trying to have it both ways. I feel like it's trying to have it both ways. Yeah. It's sort of like yeah. almost saying, like, I don't know, like, there is nuclear family, but it could happen later in life because the colleague is also a little bit older, like, who's getting married. And that, you know, like, it just doesn't, like, the nuclear family still exists. It just doesn't exist in the way that, like, Tom imagines it. Because, like, even, yeah. like, the backstory says that the nuclear family is dead because both Summer and Tom's parents are divorced. Like, they talk about that at the bar. Yeah. And she talks about how she doesn't want to be in a relationship. Like, she is influenced by her parents' divorce. Like, she mentions that as one of the arguments for her not dating, which, again, would have been mm. interesting to maybe explore for a second, but Tom never listens to this person. So, yeah. Mm. I just thought the idea of someone standing there and being like, other mothers stay, and I was like, I'm sorry, but which person in the world do you think wants to get a card that says, hey, thank you, other mother? <laughs> I think it's also kind of funny because it's that kind of commercialized. Because I mean, we talked kind of about like the um, card factory and sort of like this sort of commercialized love, about this sort of like commercialization of queerness, like into like the sort of into this sort of like larger. It's like the kind it's kind of pink exploitation is happening in this film and the opening scene. Um, but then it's like I don't know. Do you think the card factory people are actually way happier than Tom is? Even though it's supposed to be this sort of like you know um, thing that sort of like Tom is very critical of, and is like you know all these sort of like false expectations and these sort of heteronormative expectations that are like not um, that aren't like working for me are, aren't happening. But then it's like you know the card factory owner. Like I mean, he's sort of like um, jokey character. Um, like he's like you know like oh I love my wife and sort of and he's like yes but, like oh this this line is from one of our cards. It doesn't make it any less true. But sort of like. <laughs> Still, still, these characters are still, like, really happy. And you've got, like, Millie, who's works there, who's also, like, really happy in her own life and sort of, like, the woman with her cat and stuff. And it's sort of, like, they they just seem to kind of get on with it and get it, whereas Tom is unhappy because maybe he invests in them too much, whereas they're sort of, like, yeah, like, we know they're not real. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. What I thought was interesting was that the boss is still trying to make it somehow work for Tom at this company, even though his work performance is down. He's saying, oh, you can just switch departments, and I don't think that's how it would work in a usual work. Yeah. Like, you would just have to pull it together and still get the results that they expect from him, but that he is somehow able to channel his energies into writing up these reading cards that definitely touching the nerve of the topics of grief and sympathy. Seems quite surprising to me too. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of let's just commercialise your sadness instead. Which is sort of like I mean it's quite funny, it's like quite satirical. <laughs> like you yeah. It just feels it's, like such yeah. a twenty first century kind of discussion of just just commercialise your pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that he is then able to just walk out of that job too. And that he can be being unemployed and <laughs> Applying I can still afford that apartment as well with the bloody, the like, exactly, the like blackboard war. It's like, who, does that exist? No, and like, that how also didn't exist in 2009. I know that much. Like, yeah. Also the fact that like Summer is like a um receptionist type of person, like a, an assistant, and again has like a huge apartment with like beautiful but wallpaper. As- as yeah. we know, the summer effect, she gets it for like 9% Ooh. less than the going rate. So, yeah. oh, I forgot <laughs> about that. You explained it completely. So, uh, actually, I just love the fact that this movie like touched so much on, um, desirability politics, but just didn't have it like in it to like explore that in any interesting way. <laughs> Not even going into, like, women who look a certain way according to conventional attractiveness uh, standards in a patriarchy, like, get certain things, and it's not a pure privilege, but it is a privilege, and then just doesn't engage with it whatsoever. Yeah, all it does is just be like, well, that's bad because it makes men feel bad. No, that's, that's like it. Like, the critique is as far as, like, it concerns Tom slash the male characters and sort of, like, how it personally affects them, and that's where it ends. Is it annoying when women are so hot that you just really want to date them and then they don't want to date you? And then she ends up dating Lars from Norway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did think it was interesting when you see just, uh, which again, I don't remember from watching it the first time, but when you see the back of the head of the husband, mm-hmm. he doesn't seem to be like a huge, huge massive like bodybuilder or something. So I wonder if that movie is sort of trying to tell us like it could have been Tom. Like, you know what I mean? Like, she doesn't necessarily, like, go for, like, a certain 
Because he is so, he feels so threatened by the idea that she, because he does make that face when she tells him that he, she used to date a girl in college. And then when she refers to her old boyfriend as the Puma and that they never left the bedroom, like the end person that she ends up with sort of in terms of like body type, I would say, like mm -hmm. does seem to be sort of more like a, like a scrawny guy. So it just truly just wasn't, it's just personality based. <laughs> yeah. Like she, the problem is you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> is it the husband that we see at the party? Because she, like, hugs yeah. someone and then he sees the ring, but it's sort of, like, not made obvious that... I mean, yeah, it is, it is the husband. It's just him, yeah, the blonde. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. I, meant the, I meant the segment where you, like, see her having a... Yeah, no, no. Listed off Because at the same thing at the party, yeah. I was like, is that the husband? Is that not the husband? I'm not sure. It's because you couldn't only see the back of the head, and it's, like, light brown... Color yeah. sort of, but I wasn't sure. But thank you for you two for paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that like he doesn't then become something that Tom cares about. Like he's not like once he sees that he doesn't like go over and like punch him or something or like it's sort <laughs> of he just le It's like the thing is that like Summer doesn't want him specifically, and sort of he doesn't then go about kind of learning more about who she's actually into or like why she's not into like you know, what happened there, like, who is she talking to right now, has that got anything to do with it, like, the camera, like, doesn't, like, kind of indicate, like, you can you can pick up, again, it hints that perhaps this is the husband, because it just makes sense that it would be, or, like, the uh, fiancé, but it, it, Tom does not care enough to, like, actually look at his face and, like, give you any sort of understanding of who this character is, he just leaves... This is the end of part one of our discussion of 500 Days of Summer. Part two soon to come. Since this movie generates so much discussion and opinions, please feel free to share yours with us on our social media, which you can find in the description of the episode. We're on Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, you know the works. And as always, please feel free to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'll read out five star reviews we hope to hear from you soon, so bye-bye.